This is the Six Man Show, an Orlando Magic podcast, with your hosts, Luke Silvia and Jonathan Osborne, covering all things Magic basketball. By fans, for fans. Go Magic! What's going on, Orlando Magic fans? You guys are back with the Six Man Show. Today is March 25th, 2024. Jonathan Osborne here, as always, joined by my co-host, Luke Sylvia. Luke, the Magic now have 11 games to go in the season. We were just talking about this off-air before we started recording. The Magic go 5-6, and 6-5 six, six and five over their last 11 here. If you look at the standings and, and what some of the Eastern Conference contemporaries have to do, at least the fifth seed, you're starting to feel pretty good about that, Luke. How's it going? Hey, you feel good about that? You feel good about just if you're someone like me who... I just literally just want to make it to where we're not in the play. We could be the sixth seed. I'll be ecstatic. I don't care. Um, that being the case, yeah, I mean, it seems likely that we're we're five or better, and feels at worst six or better. It, it would have to be catastrophic down the stretch if to, for it not to be. So it seems like we've we've kind of you know we're able to take a deep breath and and think that we're we we should not absolutely should not be in the playing games by any stretch. Jonathan, I wish on this episode I was shirtless, but I'm not. A lot of people do. But you know where I was shirtless. I got to be shirtless on the post game live with producer Kevin after that game against the Pelicans, which we'll we'll break down and get into the game as a whole. But got another shirt rip off in that episode. It wasn't as clean as the last time that we were on. I couldn't quite get to the, the material was weird. So I ended up having to just take it off. But but yeah, I if you guys are not tuning into those post game lives, Kevin always brings the energy. You might get a surprise guest like that if the magic are crushing it. Maybe a five might game get win a streak. surprise flash like that. There you there you go. Exactly. I mean, where else are you getting magic wins and nipples, to be honest with you? Probably nowhere. Just here. So you're welcome. You guys should need to tune in. I, I do. Kevin is one of the best in the game in general when it comes to podcasting and what he does. So check him out. He's got those live reactions. Super interactive with the chat. If you guys have not checked it out yet, we are getting the post to the postseason. And I know that Kevin is pumped for some postseason post game lives. But the, the just the environment, just like the the energy in the air, is going to be palpable every every morning you wake up in the postseason. And so to to watch the games, get to watch with Kevin afterwards, or react with Kevin afterwards. There's there's nobody that does it better, to be honest. The post game live presented by Rockham, our presenting mm-hmm. sponsor of the post game live. Don't forget, folks, if you go to RockhamSocks.com, you can get twenty percent off every order from Rockham with code Magic twenty. And yeah, Kevin's been doing a great job with those. You and I have been doing an okay job when we got to fill on. We're getting fill in better. For those it was always fun. We're getting better. We are getting better. And uh, yeah, back to the post game live from Thursday. I felt bad for our friends over at the uncontested. That was you're wearing the Pokemon shirt because we we lost a, a bet to those guys a couple seasons ago. Mm-hmm. And the 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 way that we made good on that bet is we had to buy some t shirts from their shop. And uh, mine's still sitting in my closet. I don't I don't quite fit into it anymore. I've I've gained a couple of pounds since then, unfortunately. <laughs> but I was like, oh man, he's ripping the Pokemon. I hope they don't see that and they take that as disrespect because it. Definitely, uh, we definitely didn't mean it that way. It's Next not season, the magic. Take it how you want. We cashed in <laughs> on the bet. I'm ripping the shirt. I needed a shirt I could rip. We spent our own damn money on that shirt. All right, <laughs> we exactly can do whatever right. we want with it. Mm-hmm. Um, I think next year we probably get you some good old like Hanes white T-shirt or Fruit of the Loom like on deck packages of shirts, for packages sure. of those just ready to go so that you can rip them whenever you want. And it's not impossible, but it's looking. Like that is probably the last nipple showing for Luke of this 2023-2024 season. Who knows? It could bleed into the postseason in terms of if you were to do something like win your last two or three games and then you take the first two games of the first round, I'll accept it. You know, I'll I'll accept it. I'll go get a Fruit of the Loom t-shirt package and uh, and make it happen. So it, it could overflow. There's some hope for that. We'll see. But... I, you know, I, who knows? It could make a return. 
some people made a suggestion that we should get a sponsor for like Luke ripping his shirt off. So if you're out there and you're a t-shirt manufacturer and you want to sponsor that segment, if and when it does happen, then you're okay with us ripping your products live on. If you have a just a great made shirt, you're like, no, this is the unrippable shirt. Yeah. And you just want Luke to prove it by trying to rip the shirt off, then we there can do go. that too. You know, hit hit us up. We're we're open for all uh, you know business ventures on, on this side of things. Absolutely. All right. Uh, if you are coming to our group night coming up this Saturday when the Magic take on the Memphis Grizzlies, if you're part of the the first sixty and part of that initial wave of tickets before they sold out, and you are coming to to the pregame hoops with us. Be on the lookout for your email. I talked to my guy, John McCall, earlier today, and he said that those emails should be going out really with all of the details, you know, what you can and cannot bring and, and what times those are going to be at. So don't forget, if you're part of that, we're going to play, I think it's somewhere between one and three, a couple hours on the floor there. Then we're all going to leave and, and shower. And then from like 4.30 to 6 o'clock-ish, like that window there, uh, we're all going to head over to Jam Hot Chicken where you can grab some grub if you would like. And obviously, just hang out and enjoy the vibes and the atmosphere there. And then around six o'clock, we'll all head over uh, to to the to the game. So if you were not part of that first sixty and you still want to come to that game and you want to get a deal on those tickets, you can go to fibo enterprise dot com slash s i x t h m a n and then the number six. Uh, you can still get discounted tickets if you just want to sit with us and sort of hang out at that game. Something else is going on that day that I want to tell you all about. Coming up on March 30th, our friends over at the Orlando Magic are teaming up with Starry. Uh, for Starry Hoops Madness, this is going to be Saturday, March 30th from 2 o'clock to 6 o'clock p.m. at Icon Park, located at 8375 International Drive in Orlando. There's going to be a fully branded Starry basketball court there for fans to shoot threes. And you can compete against Magic Legends Jason Williams, White Chocolate, Rashard Lewis and the Human Torch, our friend Terrence Ross. Uh, each legend is going to own basically an hour on that court where fans are going to have the opportunity to beat them in a three point contest. And then the top three fans at the end of each hour are going to compete in a shoot off to win some prizes. There's going to be a starry content studio giveaways, team appearances and giveaways, free starry and uh, starry zero sugar. So uh, if you're not coming to our event, but you're still coming to the game that night and you want something to do during that time, um, this is a, a great thing for you guys to do. So uh, be on the lookout for that and, and definitely go to that. It's gonna it sounds like it's going to be a great time. And our next episode of the Six Fan Show is going to be this Wednesday when the Magic take on the Golden State Warriors. So as you are leaving Kia, our guy Ben will be outside. Um, this is a platform, like we have built this platform, but we want to share it with magic fans and, and listeners of the show um so if you've ever felt like hey i could be on a podcast i could talk about this team just like these guys do that's the opportunity where you guys have the ability to to do that so if you just want to come and share how excited you are about the magic or if they have a bad loss and you want to rant about how bad you think they suck or whatever the case may be um the six fan show is your opportunity to do that and the next one will be this wednesday outside of kia after the magic take on the warriors now let's get to the state of the Magic. This week, the Magic went 2-1 and one with wins over Charlotte and the New Orleans Pelicans, followed by a heartbreaking loss to the Kings on Saturday. The Magic currently sit fifth in the Eastern Conference with a record of 42-29. and 29. They're 15 games back of first place Boston, four games back of Milwaukee, just one game back. They are one game back of the three-seed Cleveland Cavaliers, a half game back of the New York Knicks. They're uh, two games up on Indiana, three games up on Miami and Philadelphia. On the season, the Magic are 21st in the NBA in offensive rating. They are third in the NBA in defensive rating for the entire season and 12th in the league in net rating. Post-All-Star break, however, the Magic are 16th in offensive rating. They've been scoring the ball, shooting the ball a little bit better as of late. First in the league in defensive rating. They have been the best defensive team in the league since the All-Star break. Fifth overall net rating. Looking at the injury report, we do have a couple of additions uh, this week. Gary Harris missed the second half against the Pelicans on Thursday with a sore right foot. He also missed Saturday versus the Kings. And then Caleb Houston started in Gary Harris's place for the Magic on Saturday. He left the game in the first quarter with a sore ankle and did not return. Uh, I think both of those guys are questionable uh, heading into the, the next game. So we'll have to um, probably just wait and see what happens with those guys. Hopefully we get some good updates, Luke. Um, and, and yeah, hopefully we get those guys back. 
So let's jump back uh, to Thursday against the New Orleans Pelicans. This was really a, a fun game, Luke. Um, Magic didn't get out to the best start, however. We're down 21-9 to in that first quarter. Jalen Suggs gets a little crazy, hits a few threes uh, to end the first quarter. Magic were down just by five. And then the bench unit comes in in that second quarter and just goes to work. Cole Anthony, Joe Ingles, Mo Wagner, all those guys were plus 16s in the box, plus minus in the second quarter alone. Magic outscored the Pelicans 34 to 20 to give the Magic the 57 to 48 lead heading into the half. A couple of minutes into the third quarter, the Magic were, you know, already sort of building on their lead, but Brandon Ingram hyperextended his knee. It was really a nasty sight. Doesn't sound like it's too serious. He's going to miss too much time. Hopefully just a couple of weeks. Uh, but the Magic from that point on just like really took this game over again, outscored the Pelicans 38 to 27, took a 20 point lead into the fourth quarter, but the Pelicans open up the fourth quarter on a 10 to nothing run to cut the lead to 10. But the Magic answer uh, a little bit of a run uh, on their own. And now, Luke, we're going to get into one of our favorite segments here. This week's Jam Hot Chicken Jam of the Week. We're going to go back to the 731 mark in the fourth quarter. Magic up 18 at this point. CJ McCollum tries to get past Franz Wagner, but Franz Wagner pokes the ball loose. Ends up with the ball. He and Paolo Bancaro on the two-on-one fast break. He lobs the ball up to Paolo. Paolo just floats through the air, grabs it one-handed with the right hand, and jams it down. Give the Magic a 20-point lead uh, with 721 left to go in the game, Luke. And after the Pelicans made their run, the Magic came back, immediately made their run. Game at that point pretty much felt like it was over. And uh, yeah, that's this week's Jam Hot Chicken Jam of the Week. We've had a couple, or we've had one other time this season, and it was recent when it came to Jam of the Week that we just, it was a toss-up between a few different dunks. But I would venture to say this is maybe the closest that it's that it's been before, just because, you know, this Palo dunk was incredible. The alley-oop, you know, from, from you know, Franz to him, like you said, and just the way that he just continues to go towards the sky and jams it down. Super impressive. There was another point in this game that the Magic, it just looked like it was turning into a slam dunk competition. It's happened a few times this year where that is the case. Paolo Bancaro has the ball in the elbow and Jalen Suggs notices that CJ McCollum has kind of fallen asleep at the wheel. Baseline cuts to the hoop. Paolo with an incredible bounce pass and Jalen just detonates on Jonas Valanciunas. And to me like that, I that got me out of my seat as I'm sure it did the same for you. Anytime you have the chance to dunk on a seven footer, I believe that's already happened this year to Valanciunas as well, if I'm not mistaken. But, but from a, a Magic player, it was either this year or last year. But yeah, Valanciunas was not having a good time when he saw Jalen Suggs elevating and, and putting it down. So that was kind of our honorable mention. It was a toss up, and but the, obviously Paolo Bencaro and the the just the way that it effectively put everything away was was awesome. Now, like you said, that was the Jam Hot Chicken Jam of the Week. Jam Hot Chicken is a Nashville and L.A. inspired hot chicken shack locally owned and operated in Winter Park at 400 West New England Avenue, Suite 13 in Hannibal Square. And Jonathan, we got some big news on at Jam Hot Chicken on all social media, which is where you can find news like this. But to this point, Jam Hot had not been open on Tuesdays. That is changing. Jam Hot Chicken will now be open on Tuesdays from 11 a.m., to 5 p.m. So if you're in the area on Tuesdays, maybe you work in the area and you you maybe you you dabble. I have a buddy of mine that goes to Jam Hot quite a bit because he works near near there. But now I'll have to tell him. Now you can go on Tuesdays. You can do that on your lunch break. Go check them out or a little bit of an early dinner action. Who knows? I'm just happy that for my weight's sake. I don't live near Jam Hot Chicken because I would be there a dangerous amount and them now being open on Tuesdays would only heighten that. So go check them out. Like I said, follow them at Jam Hot Chicken on all their social media and go check out their website, jamhotchickenfl.com. Personal favorite of mine, accessing the menu, ordering ahead, and it will be there and it'll stay hot even if you're running a few minutes behind on that pickup order. Go check them out, Jam Hot Chicken. Let them know we sent you. Back to the New Orleans game, Luke. Paolo makes that dunk, the Jam Hot Chicken Jam of the Week. 
Magic go up by 20. Really all, all she wrote from that point on uh, with about like almost a little bit less than like six minutes to go. Pelicans wave the white flag and the Magic win this one, 121 to 106. Yes, there was no Brandon Ingram, you know, for the, most of the second half of this game. Magic had really already taken control at that point. Zion with the eight turnovers really hurt the Pelicans as well. Uh, but it was just a, it was, it was a, a really a team effort, like one of those by committee type of wins. When you, we talk about Franz with 18, Paolo with 20, Jalen leading all scores for the Magic with 22, J.I. with 9, Cole with 10, Mo Wagner with 14. We had talked about this on the, the last podcast leading up to this game. Hey, this is Magic been beating up bad teams recently. When they played playoff games or playoff teams a couple of weeks ago in the Knicks and the Pacers, they got the crap kicked out of them. And will the Magic be able to sort of like rise to the occasion against a good Western Conference playoff team uh, still very much in the playoff hunt on their side of things? And they want to come in and, and they want to they get a win. And we talked about like Franz like has not been playing well against teams above 500. And I don't, I don't want to say like definitively we've got answers on those. But we at least didn't get more evidence the other way. Magic fall you know, asleep 21 and 9 to start this game. Jalen Suggs, who we did not have uh, against the Knicks a couple of weeks ago, he's the spark plug that really puts the Magic back into this game to close out the first quarter. And then the bench just comes in and starts throwing haymakers and, and lands some haymakers. Um, and then Paolo Bancaro and the, the guys to, to start that fourth quarter, you know, they come back in and, and really deliver the knockout punch and end this game. Didn't totally definitively answer all those questions, Luke, but I feel a lot better. I mean, we're going to talk about the Kings game as well. That game didn't end up going the way that we wanted it to, but the way that they have competed in these last two games against teams above 500, against playoff teams, has made me feel a lot better. And the way the Magic just took it to the Pelicans in this second half was really, really impressive and just came away feeling really good after this win. I I think that this game, even though was this the one that was NBA TV? Yes. Even though it was NBA TV, this is absolutely a game that should have been actually on national television. One of the major programming channels. What it has to be. It's a number five team in the West against a number five team in the East. So much hype and, and importance now that you're getting down to the playoffs. And then that stretch and just everybody's jockeying for position in their respective conferences. This was a ginormous game, a game where the Orlando Magic were not favored at home, despite how good they have been at home. Still not being favored, which to me just shows like how big of a game it was, but also the fact that we obviously would not have been surprised that the Pelicans walked away with this one. Felt like a game that was a 50 50 type of game. And it being the importance of them being over 500 obviously elevated everything because the Magic have not been good against over 500 teams. After that Kings game, the Magic are now 17 and 23 against teams that are over 500. But one of the things that are is trending in the right direction is the bench. We've had questions about the bench. They were the reason for the hot start for the Orlando Magic to start the season. They were They were the direct reason why we had so much success. And we have just been ever since then trying to, trying to get back on track with the bench. Guys like Cole Anthony contributing consistently him being a huge part of that. And we've also seen obviously like with, with Mo Wagner and Joe Ingles and their chemistry developing throughout the year. But in both of these games that we have just saw this past week, since the last episode, the bench is the reason the bench is the reason that you were in the game against Sacramento. The bench is the reason that you end up winning this game by 15 convincingly against a good New Orleans Pelicans team with some scary players on the other side. We saw it in full effect. Zion Williamson is a Mack truck. That dude is strong and he won't be denied. You know he doesn't even care about shooting the three ball and you still can't stop him. Feels a little bit like Giannis in that respect. But just a big game with a lot of big names and up and coming names. This was a really exciting game, especially for magic fans. But like you said, all by committee in this one. And if you look at team stats, it, the magic did what they do. They outscored new Orleans. They scored 62 points in the paint. 
Yeah, you had 16 turnovers. That's also part of the Magic brand at this point, unfortunately. But you forced 19. And if you're going to have 16 turnovers, you better make sure the other team has more than you. Magic passed the ball incredibly well. 33 assists. As Jalen Suggs says quite a bit, the ball is popping. Like, it's moving around. Finding guys and just finding the open man. You pass that ball enough and you have enough off-ball action, you are going to eventually find the open man. And the Magic put that on full display against the New Orleans Pelicans. 38.9% from three. 14 made threes. That's big for this team, especially. And despite a night where you shoot 68% from the free throw line, it doesn't matter because you checked pretty much every other box in this one. The ball was moving. You were getting points in the paint. You were forcing turnovers, wreaking havoc. This was you 10 offensive rebounds to their three. That The Magic put a lot, a lot on display tonight. Uh, on that night and uh just it was it was an incredible impactful win that they very much needed because like you said there's a lot of things to be answered and this was kind of one step further closer to those things being answered yeah the magic pretty much had the advantage in every category like all like facets of the game just felt like the magic were better thursday night but when you look at the big discrepancy in the three-point shooting, 14 threes made to uh, New Orleans six. They shot 30% on the game from behind the arc. And then the turnovers, and, well, the Pelicans turnovers and the Magic's offensive rebounds uh, lead to the Magic having you know eight more field goal attempts. All that just comes down to the Magic just blowing this team out. It was really, really fun to watch. One thing, Luke, and I think I finally figured it out, I always look at NBA.com. I know you look at ESPN for a lot of these stats, and a lot of times we have discrepancies. I think what happens is ESPN updates things in real time. A lot of times, NBA.com, once the NBA.comers, I guess, have had time to really rewatch the game, sometimes they'll update statistics. Mm -hmm. So I think that's what happens. Like it must have been, um, you know, 19 at one point. And now NBA.com has changed to 18 or whatever. That's just for you and me. Most people aren't going to care about that at all. Right. But we've been doing this for years now. We're like ESPN will say one thing for you. NBA.com for me says another. And I think that's what's going on. But ultimately, that doesn't really matter. People don't care about that. <laughs> Big win for the Magic. Like we said, coming into this game, you needed to prove that you could hang. You know, you could be competitive with these really good teams, especially these really good Western Conference teams. So the Magic are going to have a few more of those opportunities this week. Uh, but Luke, you've got you look like you've got another point before we move on here. I, I just wanted to highlight it because it's absolutely deserved. Paolo Bancaro, second triple double of his career, second one this year. The last one being against Denver in January, just a couple short months ago, where he had thirty two, ten, and eleven. We all remember that game. But this one against New Orleans, twenty ten and eleven, not bad at all. 11 assists, 4 turnovers. Obviously, you'd like to limit turnovers, but when a guy has that many assists, second year in the league, you give him a pass on those 4 turnovers because he gave you 11 assists. His guys were hitting shots. We talk about that all the time as well, Jonathan, where people, I see it all the time, people are like, well, Paolo only averages, you know, only had this many assists in the game, but imagine if he had guys that were hitting shots. He has so many passes and so many great looks that he creates for his teammates that they just don't knock down the shot. Well, in this one, they were knocking down the shot and gave you kind of a glimpse into what that will look like when his teammates are growing, getting better at shooting the three ball, also bringing in some three shooters, and how high that assist number has the potential to be. Paolo Bancaro genuinely could become a a player in this league that's averaging eight, nine assists a game because he's just so special and has put his vision on on full display, especially recently. But in this one, triple-double, to shout out to Paolo Bancaro for that uh, triple-double. I really think, and, and I know he gets a lot of the like comparisons to LeBron, at least stylistically. I don't think anybody is comparing, comparing Paolo's talent to LeBron's talent or Paolo's potential to what we've seen LeBron do for you know 21 years. But when you watch these guys play, it's hard not to notice, like, the stylistic similarities and just the way that they move and the way that they play. But I think in Paolo's prime, he's a guy that could average you know, 25 or 27 a game, like that 27, 7, and 7 that we saw LeBron do for what felt like 15 straight years. I really do think Paolo can can reach that level. And to Paolo's credit, I think he missed like his first like six or seven attempts from the floor in this game. 
still ended up 19, 9 of 18 from the floor, 50% on the game. It was 7 to 10 in the second half. It was just awesome. So yeah, Paolo Bencaro, the 20 point, 10 rebound, 11 assist, triple double. And it was, it was like, it was kind of quiet, to be honest. Mm-hmm. It's crazy just how effortless, effortlessly he's doing these things at this point. Now let's go ahead and give a quick shout out to our patrons. Uh, quite a few new patrons this week. We're going to go ahead and give all of them a, a special shout out in just a moment here. Uh, but our patrons are the folks that help support every single thing that we do, make each and every episode possible, every bit of content that we do, you know, any trips that we go on, anything like that. Uh, patrons help make all of that possible. Cannot thank you all enough. If you would like to join our Patreon and join the the folks who, again, we'll talk about in a second, just recently joined the Patreon and uh, are going to be uh, yeah, a big part of what we're doing moving forward here, you can find us at patreon.com slash the six man show. Talking about the new patrons here, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six new patrons on this episode. A big shout out to Anthony Velez, who joined our all star tier, Ross Holder, who joined the all star tier, What's Up Playoffs 2024, joined our Hall of Fame tier. Luke's my hero. I think he's talking about you, Luke, joined the $5 all star tier level. Dylan Fay joined the Hall of Fame tier, and Richard Winslow joined our All Star tier as well. A big shout out to all of our new patrons. We try to give our new patrons a special shout out each and every week, and we give our Hall of Fame and Elite tier patrons a shout out on each episode. A big shout out to our friends over at Court Cousins who had their uh, Court Cousins night. I believe that was Thursday against the Pelicans. Drew Gooden, Armin, Carson Tulo, Ellis, Jonathan Borges, normal magic player history, Gabe Gaines, Wiffle, Michael Martin, Jamel Miller, Michael Salapong, Donkey Punch Dave, Paolo and Francis, Warren, Pierre A, Dylan Holden, Mr. Mikey, Eduardo Sanchez, Dan Mull, Dodo 15, Bobby Skinner, Godi 93, Teddy Sylvia, Eric Lopez, Fuchsia, Bill Fulton, Edmund Lagone, Jose Esquilin, Caleb Pete, Cannibalism, Time, Mr. TV, ESPN, Really Sucks, Gear 95, Shred, Junior Bruce Haffrey can shot him one seven seven. Bobby the Don Himlo Ben Himro, R M Prof two two one Ray Pastrana at Magic Kid seven one four, Mysterious Mosley Victor Cologne Irish Magic Mike Austin Lampy Random Hustle Only Franz Maria Keith Loss Fritz Currency Kev Bruv Sal Casey Green Santi Leon Kane Eckler The Distract the Mod Simpson Chansu Tom Gatson Dead Air Richard Tuttle Jeremiah Quintero Magic Wired Debo nineteen eighty Magic Matt Michael Thompson Mama Richmond. Next Napa, J.R. Ponce, What's Up Playoffs 2024, and Dylan Fay. A big shout out to all of our patrons. You can find us at patreon.com slash the six man show. Now, Luke, I, I feel like the first good bit of the pod so far has been pretty positive, right? Things are going to turn a little bit. Now, this loss was not the end of the world, but we're sitting here now roughly 24 hours removed from that, and I'm still... I'm still pretty annoyed by it. I'm still really, really upset about it. Um, it, it was a tough loss for for a number of reasons. Most, in, like biggest, first, most importantly, you just had another opportunity to put space between you and, and some of these teams, you know, below you in the standings. Uh, with the loss in this game, you lost your hold on the fourth seed in the Eastern Conference. And right now, you'd be like right there with Cleveland for the three seed. Like you'd be so close to the three seed. And Luke, this loss, without a doubt, wasted Jonathan Isaac's best performance of his career. We're going to talk about this in detail. We're going to talk about the game. We're going to talk about Jonathan Isaac, some of the things that happened down the stretch, some of the other moves in this game. But I just think it's so crazy after everything that we went through with Jonathan Isaac and all the questions and all the frustration and all the patience and everything that he now looks legitimately better than ever. Like he has never looked as good as he does right now. And we talked about it for three years, pretty much on this show about how unprecedented it was this situation that we were dealing with Jonathan Isaac and how he had just missed so much time and what he was going to look like coming back. And the fact that he's been so great this season, he's played most of the games in, you know, on the year, and just as good as he looks, Luke, do you want to you know, say a, a little bit about J.I. and just how good he looked in this game, how looked he's good all year, before we go through like the details of this game and, and his performance? I, I mean, it's hard to... Because you get to the, you know, you just want to start talking about the game. But what I will say that 
I think obviously he plays in this one 23 minutes. All of them impactful. Each minute impactful in this one. And for me, to see him once again be in the position he was in where he's closing this game, I was like, oh, it feels like the beginning of the year before he had, you know, some some injury stuff and then getting back into it in this season, it felt like that. Where it's like this dude really could be somehow get back to the point where he's pay, playing 20 to 25 minutes a game in the NBA. And it feels like it could be one day consistent again. So for me, that was an encouraging sign. We know what Jonathan Isaac can be defensively, but if what he showed us offensively, and we've gotten flashes when it comes to things like the turnaround in the mid range at the elbow, whatever we have gotten flashes of Jonathan Isaac. We got all the Jonathan Isaac in this game against Sacramento. You can smile and you can laugh. We got all of Jonathan Isaac. And I just, I could not believe it. I, I could not believe it. I'm excited to talk about his stints in this game. And that's really all I'll say before I spoil the our conversation about him during this game. Okay. Let's get into the game. Again, we talked about the fact that Caleb Houston was in the starting lineup. No Gary Harris in this game. 19 lead changes and 13 ties in this game. If you haven't watched this game, before we say another word, stop what you're doing. Find a way to to watch this game. You know, if you have it on DVR or you know, League Pass, whatever, you you just have to watch this game. It, it was truly an incredible basketball game to watch, even if you're you know you didn't have a stake in the game. Not a great start. Magic are down 20 to 12 in the first quarter. Now. A lot of this game we're just going to be looking at from the lens of what Jonathan Isaac did. I don't think, and, and Luke, let me get your confirmation on this. I don't think it's ridiculous to say that this game came down to the, the minutes that Jonathan Isaac played and the minutes Jonathan Isaac did not play. That was the difference in this game. Uh, I mean, I, I'll try to find the stat before we talk about it again, but he was like one of four players to have a plus 27 in the game and still lose or something ridiculous like that. And that's all you need to know. He comes in. He's an absolute bucket getter in every minute in his first stint. I, could I have not, it here. I could not believe my eyes. Yeah, go ahead and, and, and do that one. From or 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 RL Muse on Twitter. There have been 1,870 instances of a player scoring 25 points and recording a plus minus of plus 25 or better in a game. Of those 1,870 players, just four of them have lost. Jonathan Isaac was one of those four players. So all time in the history of the NBA, 1,866 players have done this in a game and have won. Four of those guys have uh, four have lost, and Ji's performance in this game was one of those four losses. Uh, yes, that is how much the impact. Like the Magic, do not absolutely do not lose by this small a margin without Jonathan Isaac. But truthfully, without Jonathan Isaac in this game, you get absolutely just Dog blasted walked. out of your own arena. Yeah, he he took the game into his own hands, not just defensively, but offensively as well. And that was the most impressive part to me. If you watch this game, you've never watched basketball before. If you watch this game, this is not hyperbole. This is not an exaggeration. If you were to watch this game, you would think Jonathan Isaac is one of the greatest two-way players in the history of the NBA. That is how dominant and how impactful he was on Saturday night. Enough talking around it let's talk about it we talked a moment ago magic are down 20 to 12 in the first quarter ji checks in with 353 to go i'm just gonna like read through a series of possessions here first possession ji contest on harrison barnes forces a miss magic at the ball the next magic possession ji hits the mid-range pull up on sabonis cash the very next king's possession okay he hits the shot on sabonis we go the other way J.I. is on Sabonis. Sabonis and Malik Monk run the pick and roll. J.I. switches on to Monk. Sabonis slips inside. Monk swings it to the top of the key to Chris Duarte, who sees Sabonis wide open underneath the rim. 
He is legitimately wide open. Gets the ball. He turns around. J.I. recovers all the way from the wing and meets Sabonis at the rim and blocks. It was absolutely disgusting. The Magic get the ball. Next Magic possession, J.I. hits a corner three. They go the other way. J.I. switches onto Monk again. Monk tries to pass the ball. J.I. deflects it. Cole Anthony ends up with it. He and J.I. are running the floor. He kicks it ahead to J.I. for the and one dunk. A couple of possessions later, J.I. cuts back door. Mo Wagner finds him for the open, easy dunk. A couple of minutes later into the second quarter, Cole Anthony finds J.I. underneath the rim for an easy two. A couple of possessions later, J.I. hits a baseline turnaround right in Keegan Murray's face. And then the very next possession, hits an open three from the top of the key. And then a couple of uh, Kings possessions later, he affects another Malik Monk floater. And the Magic lead 37-32 to when J.I. checks out. So that was a 25-12 to 12 run, um, pretty much just at the hands of J.I. And Luke, let's just pause to talk about that you know 10-minute stretch or whatever for J.I. in the first half. Because like you said, I legitimately and genuinely could not believe what I was seeing. He could not do any wrong and had a hand in almost every single play on both ends of the floor in, in that stretch. We we know he has confidence defensively. There's no reason not to. Offensively, I've not seen that confidence out of him ever S- since I, the Denver game in the bubble. Yeah, fair. He but the it, Magic were down in that game. I think he, he and Markel come in, and the Magic go on like a thirteen to nothing run and take the lead. In this one, I was like, oh, this might be. Something maybe not. We're not maybe not replicating this every game offensively, but this can be a possibility. The moment I knew it was a possibility, it was in that second quarter. He gets the ball. I I don't know if it was Dell or, or who passed it to him here. He gets a pass as he's slashing across the lane. Keegan Murray is on him, and the dude doesn't even think twice. He posts up Keegan Murray and goes right into his fadeaway. <laughs> right into a post fade and I was like whoa 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 whoa, whoa. so hey, disgusting hey whoa whoa and what it, are we doing just, there was just no hesitance at all at all and I was like this this guy genuinely could give us stretches like this once every few months when he is like playing 20 plus minutes in a game and it's ridiculous to think about obviously he was on a heater and that's not you know, something you could do every game. But like I said, every few months, I would not be surprised in the in the future that we are talking about Jonathan Isaac having 17 points in eight minutes or whatever it was. It, it was 17. Me. It was 17 points, four rebounds, a steal and a block in eight minutes, 13 seconds in the first half. He was a plus 13 in those minutes. Yeah. And I, I mean, listen, he's going to if he just continues to have offensive outbursts like this. Teams are going to game plan for him offensively because I I can pretty much guarantee you the Sacramento Kings did not game plan for Jonathan Isaac offensively. It was all about defensively and what they're going to do on the floor when he is on the court. So, you know, we who knows? But this gave me hope that Jonathan Isaac can can be effective because the narrative as of late, in general, with Jonathan Isaac has been he is such an elite defender. And even if he is kind of a negative offensive player or just equal, he, it doesn't matter. But if he can give you elite defense and great offensive player, uh, I was watching last night and I was like, oh my gosh, we have Kevin Durant. Is <laughs> Kevin Durant's on our team. Can you guys believe it? He's shooting over dudes. He's not hesitating just going for it and and confident in every single move that he made. I did, I loved when he would just jack up a corner three and miss it. I was like, I don't care. This dude catch and shoot just just no hesitation, just right into it, right? I want this guy to have all the confidence in the world. And now that I know he can get there offensively again, post injury, there I, there's nothing really else. But he was the shining star in this game against Sacramento and a loss. It's one of the more memorable losses just because of Jonathan Isaac. 
the very first play of the fourth quarter for the Magic. We're jumping ahead a little bit, but we're going to just stay here yeah. with, with J.I. for a moment here. He gets the ball at the top of the key. Malik Monk closes out. He pump fakes Monk, gets him to hesitate just for a second, steps to the right, drives through the lane. Keon Ellis and Alex Len are, are coming over. He splits them, goes around them, the left-hand layup off the glass for an and one. I had a tweet, one of my best tweets of all time, didn't get nearly the amount of attention that it should. Tracy McGrady was in the building for this game, by the way, which like, hey, T-Mac's coming to town, Magic, please just throw out a little bit of, of an advance so I can make sure that I'm in the building. Like I I would have been at this game had I known Tracy McGrady was going to be in the building and was going to be um, you know, uh, you know, welcomed and, you know, they they had like a little moment for him at half court during the game. But I tweeted I said Tracy McGrady has or, or um Tracy McGrady has on a Jonathan Isaac disguise. Like he literally he looked like freaking Tracy McGrady at points in this game. It was so ridiculous. And we talk about like if he isn't a negative or even like net neutral offensively, mm-hmm. it's great, but the way that he started the year and the way that he's progressed, to me it's like we heard all this talk about how he's been working on his offense, he's been working on his shot, all that kind of stuff. In the beginning of the year, it was like, okay, we're not really seeing that. But as he's gotten more comfortable, as he's played more minutes, everything the offense is coming along. Like He had three years worth of rust to knock off. He's not going to be this every night. He's not going to be this even one in every 10 nights. Yeah. Okay, But if Jonathan Ice can be the guy who can shoot not even 40%, he can shoot 37% from three and can sometimes create his own shot off the dribble, and is going to be a guy who, because he is such an intelligent basketball player, that is going to cut and get open, you know, looks at the basket like he did in this game, get the the put back dunks that he's had a few of this year, get the offensive rebound and go back up with it. If he can be that guy offensively and give you like 13 a game, I'm at the point now, and I think I, I don't want to get ahead of ourselves, but he talked about last week how Jamal Mosley has spoken to him about playing the five more down the stretch of this season. If J.I. can play 60-plus games a year, which if he plays every game the rest of the way, he'll hit 60 games on the season. If he can play 60 games a year and is half of, even a quarter of what he was offensively in this game and can be as good defensively as he's been all year, make him the starting five moving forward. That's where I'm at. I don't know about you. That is where I'm at. I'm, I'm trying to pull up stats here per cleaning the glass for a second just to look at J.I. at the five. But yeah, I, I, I'm hoping it just affirms everything that I'm already thinking and what you're thinking. But it, for him, it, it, don't, it almost doesn't matter what position he's playing. He's just, he, he's so versatile. And, and the only reason he'd play the five is because the Magic need would need him to. But wouldn't it be wild if Jonathan Isaac becomes a more reliable player game in and game out than like Wendell Carter Jr. We talk about Wendell and, and his injury problems seemingly consistently. But then Jonathan Isaac, if if we can just say, okay, those were all weird freak things that have happened. And if we can just get like seasons of healthy Jonathan Isaac, it's going to be a problem. For, I'm for not everyone. even. I'm not talking about like, oh, what would benefit Jai the most playing the five. I'm talking about for the Magic, what I think the best version of the Magic is, and I think it's Jonathan Isaac, you know, playing 27 to 30 minutes a game for at, at the five and, and starting games and, and closing games. Yeah. Luke, I don't. I, we're we're going to get incredibly biased, or I'm I'm going to unapologetically so. If <laughs> if the Magic, okay have a healthy Jonathan Isaac that is going to play most of the regular season and, and you know play in the the playoffs for the future of this team and you have Paolo Bancaro and Franz Wagner on the trajectory that they're playing and, and Jalen Suggs in the trajectory that he's been on the last couple of years you you put another competent player in that lineup with the magic who can who can shoot at a relatively high clip you give me that core four moving forward and the magic are winning a title in my lifetime I don't care I, I I believe that with every fiber of my being. 
Yeah. I mean, it's it's fair. It's very fair because you're obviously at that point, you know, you're you're talking about Suggs, Franz, Paolo, J.I. And then what you're adding essentially like maybe a true point guard to that group to be your starting five in it in the finals run. Seems crazy to say because they're all so young. But if we are projecting four or five years into the future, eh, maybe three or four. I mean, pa- J.I. is what like 20 what is he 27 Six. 26 yeah you've got with ji if you're wanting to win a title i you've got like five years maybe um so you got to get it done you got to move decently quick here in terms Palo of Bank adding, year seven i'm good with that yeah well absolutely at that point that's fine but if we're talking about jonathan isaac being part of the core four that wins you a championship you got to get moving a little bit. And I think they will. I mean, five years is a long time in terms of seasons going by. But yeah, so I'm I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm not going to say definitively I'm with you, but I am with you to an extent. I see see the vision, as some have said. Okay, that's going to wrap up the the J.I. Gush Fest here. Let's get back to this game. So we're going. We're, we're still uh, here in the the second quarter. The starters played fine. You know, the last seven minutes of the first half, they took a two point lead into the half. The Magic were outscored twenty to ten in the first seven and a half minutes of the third. They trailed seventy four to sixty five uh, when Ji checks back in, and the Magic end up taking a three point lead with seven seconds left in the third quarter before De'Aaron Fox has, hits a three at the buzzer to tie this. I think it was eighty one all heading into the fourth. Magic were up one with 6.08 to go in this game. Jonathan Isaac has to be subbed out. He needs a breather. He's gassed. Mo Wagner subs in for J.I. Immediately, like the ensuing possessions after J.I. checks out, who J.I. was guarding uh, Keegan Murray at this time, Murray hits back-to-back threes to give the Kings a five-point lead. So J.I.'s guarding Keegan Murray, relatively quiet in that fourth. He checks out. Murray hits back-to-back threes, give the Kings a five-point lead. J.I. checks back in with four minutes, 17 seconds to go. So almost a two-minute break. The Magic were still down five. Teams start to go back and forth for a few few minutes. A Franz layup cuts the lead to one with 56 seconds left. Other end of the floor, De'Aaron Fox misses a three. Cole Anthony comes back, makes the tough layup over Sabonis, which the the last two-minute report came out today. It said it should have been a foul. On Demonis Sabonis uh, should have been an and one with a, a, a chance to give the Magic a two point lead with 26 seconds left, but it gave the Magic a one point lead with 26 seconds left. The Kings inbound the ball to De'Aaron Fox. Jalen Suggs is, is guarding Fox near the half court line. He sort of pushes on Fox's hip. He falls back a little bit over the timeline, and the refs blow the whistle for the foul call. But Luke, I timed it with a freaking stopwatch. From the time that Jalen Suggs makes contact with Fox, backs up outside of the frame. You can't even see Jalen Suggs on the TV at this point. 3.35 seconds, the ref waited to see what De'Aaron Fox was going to do before he steps on the half-court line, which should have been an over and back. And then they blow the whistle. My issue with this is not the foul call. It was absolutely a foul. You cannot wait to see the result of a play before you decide to blow the whistle. It just sets a bad precedent in general. It is not good officiating. And to not give Jalen Suggs the benefit of the doubt at that point in the game, which was marginal contact, especially when you look at the seven or eight illegal screens that Damana Sabonis set throughout this game, and the fact that they missed the foul call on Cole Anthony, literally the possession before, this was one of the worst most egregious calls that I have ever seen watching the NBA to wait almost three and a half full seconds from the point of contact to blowing the whistle was absolutely ridiculous. Darren Fox makes both free throws to give the Kings a one point lead. The next possession, Cole Anthony has a wide open three. He misses it. J.I. grabs the rebound, kicks it out to Franz for an open three at the top of the key. He misses it. Cole Anthony grabs the rebound, drives to the basket, misses the layup. Keon Ellis ends up with the rebound. Jalen Suggs has to foul. Uh, With two seconds left, Ellis uh, splits the free throws, 
and the Magic call a timeout with, uh, I think it was like two point, uh, yeah, two point one seconds left. Now Fazan took a look at the last play and gave us a little bit of, uh, of analysis here. Basically, what happens is uh, Paolo Bancaro ends up running towards the ball towards the half court line. Joe Ingles inbounds the ball to Paolo with Paolo's back to the basket. Paolo tries to turn around and just throw up a prayer for three, which he misses, and the Magic end up losing 109-107. to But Fazan had this to say. Uh, he tweeted this about the final after timeout possession. He said, Jonathan Isaac looks as if he's supposed to screen for Paolo to, to run a curl action, but Paolo goes a little bit earlier than he was supposed to go. And then Jalen Suggs sort of runs into Keon Ellis and falls, which sort of messes up the timing, uh, which allows Keon Ellis to basically come over and help on Paolo, which made that a, a harder uh, a, a shot there. And it sort of looks like maybe they were going to try to run something for Franz. Um, it maybe it's like a second option, but they did a, a good job of, of defending that, and that uh, you know wasn't able to develop there. Um, but yeah, it just was not a not the the look that you want. Um, for a guy to to take a to take a a long contested falling three to end the game, and the Magic did not lose this game because of officiating. I want to make that very clear. The Magic lost this game because as they were scoring and getting back into this game at the beginning, or 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 trying to take the lead and take this game over at the beginning of the fourth quarter, and the Magic were scoring, they were not getting stops. J.I. goes out. Keegan Murray hits the big threes. That was a total backbreaker. Even when J.I. comes back into the game, the Magic were not able to get stops down the stretch when they were making baskets. And um, Magic should have won this game. Just like flat out should have won this game. You didn't. Um, It's not a moral victory, but the fact that now two games in a row against really good quality opponents, you were super competitive. You come away feeling okay about that. But I'm just so tired of losing to the Hawks in weird ways. And I'm tired of losing to the Kings in weird ways. And I think it's like we've lost them like the last six times in a row. And like the last four games have all come down to like three points or less, something crazy like that. And it it just sucked to lose this game. I'll start with that possession where you have three, three shots. That was egregious. And it is part of being the young team. Call Anthony missing that three. You know, maybe call Anthony in, in two or three seasons is seasoned enough to where he he's not phased and he's able to hit that shot. Franz Wagner. That was, I mean, one, that arc on full display once again. The lack of arc, I should say. Line drive, never had a chance of going in. Basically, maybe. Year four, year five, Franz doesn't brick that. We would hope, but I do think it is a, a maturity thing and age thing, and eventually it'll be. I have the same thoughts as, as well on a, just like a small sidebar here. Paolo Bancaro sometimes will miss like a a really gimme mid range shot that like a top talent in the league that is established doesn't miss, and I'm like, oh. I'm not worried about it. Does it suck that he misses, you know, some wide open shots that like he should make or that he showed us he can make? Absolutely. But a couple years down the line here, Palo Bencaro is going to be, you know, those times where like a star player is left open on an opposing team and it's in the mid range and you're like, oh, you left him wide open. He's making it. Same type of thing when it comes to Palo with that situation. Same type of thing, especially with Franz on a wide open three in a clutch moment. That should be a moment where the other team is like, oh man, he's going to make this. It's like, it's done, right? So that was ridiculous. The Jalen Suggs thing, listen, Jalen Suggs, incredible defender. With that comes towing the line a little bit. He has a fouling problem in a lot of different pivotal situations where it's like, you don't need to do that. Jalen Suggs didn't need to put his hand on his hip there. We we've forty already feet agreed. from the basket, like it just it it's unnecessary. Is, yes, that was, and then also like with the ref blowing the whistle late. Obviously, we all have that same same issue, right? Clutch moment. That's three seconds you just took off the clock. Just call it when it happens if you're going to call it, which is, was your point. But then also, the NBA has set a terrible precedent when it comes to blowing the whistle and when you blow the whistle. 
we see it, and I've heard a ref talk about it, NBA ref talk about it. I don't remember when, but I will always remember it. He's talking about the situations where a guy goes up for a shot and there's a clear foul. If he makes it in the game flow, he, they don't quote unquote want to mess up game flow and, and momentum, so they won't call it. If the player shoots it, there's a clear foul. He makes a bucket. They just keep the game going because that team is building momentum. They don't want to kill the team's momentum, basically. Stupid. If they miss the shot and it was a clear foul, they will call. They will wait for the ball to miss. We've all seen it. If you watch enough NBA basketball, we've all seen it. Shot goes up. Oh, that looked like a foul. Ref's looking at the rim. Bounces off. Doesn't He doesn't make the shot. Oh, I'll call the foul. He'll go to the line for two or three, whatever the circumstance. That legitimately is what that felt like with Jalen Sucks. This was the most extreme example of that. Ironically, the ref didn't want to mess up the flow of the game. And then he ends up just destroying the flow of the game. Like what what you the damage you did with calling it that much later versus just calling it when it happened or not calling it all detrimental, like ridiculous. You cannot overstate it enough. And I am someone who hates with all of my being to talk about refereeing. I hate talking about officiating and even talking about a bad call because at the end of the day, like you said, this wasn't about the officiating and that is not why you lost this game. And I, so I hate going there, but in that situation, I feel it's important because it was that egregious to at least talk about it. But that's all that I really have to say about any of that. It, whatever you move on in the grand scheme of things, this isn't a huge thing by any means, but at the very least you saw this team become closer to being battle tested come postseason. season. now with this game, yeah, the other possession that I didn't love was uh, like like one fourteen to go. Mm-hmm. There's 16 seconds on the shot clock. Magic are down three. Palo Bancaro has Keon Ellis on him, and he decides to go into that like step back three. Uh, that's that's one of those shots where it's like if he makes it, oh my gosh, he's a freaking superstar. <laughs> and then of course he doesn't make it. You're like, okay, I I hate that shot. So oh, yeah. it's hard to you know harp on that too much. Um, but it, it just felt like in the moment, like everybody yeah. knew that, no, that's it's not the shot that we want right now. Right. And again, like this game just came down to the fact that uh, in that fourth quarter, especially the magic could not get stops really when they needed to, like neither of these teams shot crazy, you know, from behind the arc now in the fourth quarter. Now, yeah, down the stretch, you know, there's a couple of foul calls and then you, you had to foul at the end there. Um, but eight free throws, uh, eight of nine free throws for the Kings. Magic had one free throw in the fourth quarter, and it was that very first play of the fourth quarter that we talked about with Jonathan Isaac going to the rim. Uh, feels a little bit weird that you know Paolo Bancaro and Franz Wagner, uh, Paolo with seven attempts, four of those you know were were two point attempts, and Franz Wagner had uh, he he took three three, so at least two two of those attempts, one at the rim where there was some contact that cut the lead to one in the final minute was a little bit of contact. I think they could have blown the whistle there if they really wanted to. So just the fact that like, again, the Sabonis moving screens were so ridiculous. It was like vintage Draymond. Um, the fact that you don't get any calls there was just ridiculous, but the magic shoot 50% in the quarter. Uh, the King shot 42%, but it was just like timely baskets that the Kings were getting and the magic just could not string like multiple stops and multiple baskets together. That's ultimately why you lost this game. But uh, yeah, overall it was frustrating. You look at the magic outscored Sacramento 56 to 32 in the paint, 49 bench points to Sacramento seven, which just, (laughs) just hurts when you look at it that way. A lot of that was, you know, Jonathan Isaac's 25 points uh, 10 of 35, 28% from behind the arc for the Magic. Stop me if you've heard that before. Not great. And then you 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 miss five free throws in this game. You make a couple of those, you're you're going to overtime. You make three of those, you you win this game in regulation. Like how many times we have to talk about the um you know the 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 free throw shooting, and then seven turnovers for Sacramento. They do a, a good job taking care of the ball. Magic 13 turnovers, not that bad. But I think it led to like 19 points off of turnovers, which you just cannot have. And I'm more than anything, I'm just mad that the Magic wasted this Jonathan Isaac performance. 
the only it matches career high. The only other time he scored 25 points was going back to the 2019, 2020 season where the magic lost to the Indiana Pacers by five in 29 minutes. He had 25 points, nine rebounds, assists, four steals, two blocks. And in this one in 22 minutes, 25 points, seven rebounds, a steal, two blocks. Like to me, this was the best game of, of Jonathan Isaac's career. He was a plus 26 in this game in that one against the Pacers. He was a plus four. So it was just all over the place was so impactful in this game. And again, you had a, a chance to put a little bit of a tighter grip on that four seed. You'd, you'd be right there with Cleveland for the three seed and you'd be that much further ahead, Indiana, Miami, and, and Philadelphia as we try to you know stay out of the play in here. So yeah, it just sucks that we keep losing to the Kings like this. It definitely does. The last thing I'll say here about this game, Cole Anthony, 7 of 15 from the field, 16 points, 2 of 7 from 3, not awesome. But 7 of 15 from the field. We, uh, You tell me that about Cole Anthony a couple of weeks ago, and I'd say I would absolutely take a Cole Anthony basically 50% from the field type of game with double-digit points. <laughs> So, shout out to Cole Anthony, 16 points in this one, a big part of why the bench was able to keep his team afloat. Yeah, Cole was good. I just still like came away from this game, especially when De'Aaron Fox like was really hurting the Magic in the second half. It's like you you just he had 21 in the second half, 7 of 14, and it just felt like you needed to throw a different look at him and like there were a few possessions that like Cole Anthony got switched on in De'Aaron Fox yeah. and it feels like you really could have used some Anthony Black minutes in this yeah. game and we've talked about this at various points throughout the year it just sucks that he is in such a lose-lose situation where you play well you don't play you you if you play like crap you're not going to play so like he he just can't win and this was a game where it, it really felt like hey like like Joe Ingles, in 12 minutes in this game, zero points, three rebounds, three assists, two turnovers. Like If he can be out there and, and give you basically nothing, I don't understand why Anthony Black doesn't get at least a few minutes in that second half to try to slow down De'Aaron Fox. Uh, he's just been so impactful basically every time that he's been giving an opportunity to play this year. And I felt like that was a, a, a mismanagement of your rotation. Saturday night and uh, a missed opportunity to, to get Anthony Black some big, valuable minutes. You've been quietly, I put this in quotations because it's not really quietly. You've been quietly tracking Markel Fultz's uh, like shot charts you know, over the course of the last couple of weeks. I, I genuinely don't know how you're going to play Markel when it comes to the playoffs. And... At this point, I would be all for playing Anthony Black instead of Markel Fultz. If nothing else, due to the fact that when Anthony Black is open from three, he is going to shoot it. And so far this year, he has shot close to 40% from behind the arc. And isn't like it, it, if he's not going to help with spacing and teams are going to play off of him, then fine, he's going to hit four out of every 10 threes that he takes. And I'm good with that. And to me, he's basically at least 85 to 90 percent as good defensively as Markel on ball they're pretty much equal I would probably even give the the edge to Anthony Black where Anthony Black sort of falters is sometimes off the ball falls asleep a little bit and, and gets confused with what, with what his assignment is at the time where Markel is a bit more experienced and doesn't have that problem as much but at this point I'm I'm going Anthony Black these last 11 games I don't know how you're going to play Markel in the playoffs and I feel like Anthony Black could just help you more. I'm glad you brought this up. And I'm going to highlight this play because it's necessary in terms of just looking at the grand scheme of things. And listen, some of you guys might have seen it because I, ha I saw it happen. And then uh, Vagberg on Twitter highlighted it further, right? Posted the clip, talked about it. It's something that happened during the game, and I was like, I I thought about it for like three minutes. Not gonna lie, like a couple possessions went by, and I was still irritated about this play. The play that happens essentially is that Jalen Suggs, the Kings at this point are in a two-three. Jalen Suggs beats Malik Monk off the dribble, 
goes underneath the basket, right? He goes, he's driving baseline underneath the basket. He has now dragged Monk away from his zone. And Jalen passes the ball up to the right wing to Cole. Cole passes it one pass away to Paolo, basically like center left wing ish, left center. Markel Fultz is in the corner or in the on the left wing, kind of drifting to the corner. And Paolo in that situation, the ball is popping. The right play is typically Paolo just passes that one more time. And because Malik Monk is so far over, he's not even yet to closing out to or helping in the passing lane on Markel Fultz. The right pass would have been Paolo to hit Markel Fultz technically on the wing. But you literally see Paolo Bancaro grab the ball, glance over at who is next to him about the pass maybe, and then decides, ah, I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to go ISO here. That is a problem when your player is wide open and you don't feel like you can hit him on the wing because he is going to do exactly what you're going to do, and that is just ISO because he is not going to shoot the shot. It sucks, right? I genuinely do feel for Markel Fultz. But at the end of the day, man, I'm a Magic fan, and I am observing what is what is and what isn't detrimental to this team on the court. Markel Fultz offensively has become a detriment. And people are going to say the ones that are really still riding for Fultz at this point are going to tell me that's overdramatic. That's hyperbolic. You can't say that. Absolutely, I can. Because like you said, I've been looking at his shot charts. He is going, Jonathan, like two of five, three of seven, all of which are basically in the paint. All of these shots. There's no reason. He's got the shot died of a center. And he's a guard. And he's missing these shots. I that is to the where I'm at with Markel Fultz. He cannot play in the playoffs. So that's where I'm at with it. I, I it is crazy to me that Paolo didn't feel like he could make that pass to Markel, but it's warranted. Fultz isn't taking that shot. He's not even taking it. To your point about Anthony Black, at least Anthony Black is going to take it. Markel Fultz isn't doing it. And it's just become increasingly frustrating. I know it's frustrating for Fultz. I know he wishes he could shoot that shot, but he just doesn't. And that is, unfortunately, the the toll that it's taken. I'm going to go back, like, roughly, like, the last, like, I think this is the last 18, 19 games. 1 of 4, 2 of 7, 2 of 5, 1 of 5, 6 of 12, 1 of 4, 8 of 8, 3 of 8, 1 of 4, 4 of 10, 3 of 8, 2 of 7, 0 of 4, 3 of 4, 2 of 5. There's a couple great games in there. And there's a lot of not. And they're all in the paint or right outside of it. And if he took a shot outside the paint, I would be guessing that he makes 10% of those right now. And it, that might be hyperbolic. It might be 15 to 20. Regardless, your mid-range, you cannot be shooting like 20, 25%, which is what I would guess that's the case. As of late, it was fine the beginning of the season, but then obviously we know what happened. After injury, we we realized that what what probably happened, and again, I'll reemphasize it sucks, but the facts are the facts. Unfortunately, last uh, fifteen games for the Magic. So this is the last really last twelve games for Markel. I'm looking at NBA dot com. Seventeen minutes a game, six point three points. 2.8 rebounds, 1.8 assist, 1.2 turnovers, shooting 43% from the floor. He's shooting 0% from behind the arc. He averages a third of an attempt a game. So, yeah. And then like looking at Anthony Black on the season, 4.7 points per game, 2.2 rebounds, 1.4 assists. And in my opinion, just gives you more overall defensively than Markel does. And he's shooting 38.6% from behind the arc and 46% from the floor. I, I just, the writing is on the wall that Markel isn't here next year. Like he's out of the starting lineup. He has been for weeks. We talked about it when it was happening. Like, hey, is this happening? And it was happening. The writing is on the wall that he's not going to be here. And without him even attempting threes, I don't see how he does not get played off the floor in the playoffs. Anthony Black probably ends up getting played off, like played off the floor in the playoffs, 
I'm 100% positive that Markel does. And I would go with the guy who I think has a chance to contribute in a playoff series versus the guy that I just don't have any confidence will be able to. Uh, this is the last thing I'll say, and we, and we can start to wrap up here. But I, I'll be honest. I don't care about Markel Fultz getting playoff experience. I do, however, care about Anthony Black getting playoff experience because that's a guy I project that is with the Magic for a long time. He should be. Right? He was a top 10 pick. Even if you don't think he's the long-term future of the team, you just spent the sixth pick overall on him, and you almost know without a doubt that Markel will not be here next year. Right. But but I don't think... I think Mosley is fine-tuning his playoff rotations. I'm sure he's got some things up his sleeve as far as like, okay, if Markel gets played off the court, if Cole Anthony gets played off the court, here's where we go rotation-wise. I am sure that is all in place. But yeah, you... Yeah, at that point, man, I would much rather see Anthony Black because I get what you're saying, but at the end of the day, I want Anthony Black so badly to have a playoff round under his belt where he actually logged minutes and not just in garbage time because this is invaluable experience. And if he can give you more than you think Fultz can give you, play him. Let him get played off the floor. These are all super important for his development to be able to get a taste of playoff basketball that's not garbage time minutes um that's what i'm rooting for i think Fultz will still play and we'll see if mosley is stubborn and just keeps him in to keep him in but i can almost guarantee you that's what's going to happen there's 11 games to go you're not going to start making you know massive changes to the lineup we're not going to see anthony black implemented the last 11 games here i mean even when gary harris and, and caleb houston are out you don't get any Anthony Black minutes in this right. game against Sacramento. So that tells me everything that I really need to know. And I I think that there is a good chance, however, that when the leash, start, the leash starts to shorten up in the playoffs, like Markell is going to be one of the first guys out of the, the rotation because it's just going to become incredibly apparent that you, you're not going to be able to play him on the floor. Right. All right, let's go ahead now. I think that's enough about the Sacramento game and a lot of the things that we, we, we took away from that game. Let's take a look at the week ahead. So you're off Monday, Tuesday still, and then you come back Wednesday uh, at, uh, at home versus the Golden State Warriors, Friday at home versus the Clippers, and then Saturday, second night of a back-to-back, you're at home versus the Memphis Grizzlies. Luke, I think you go 2-1 and one this week. I think you win on Wednesday. I just don't think this team wants to lose multiple games in a row here. And then I think you probably lose to the Clippers on Friday. And then you pick up the win on Saturday over the Grizzlies. Yeah, I'm pretty much in line here. My big reasoning for the Golden State thing is they play in Miami the night before. So coming off a of back-to-back, you're going into Kia where the Magic have been dominant at home. And the chances of a team that's been dominant at home dropping two in a row at home, pretty slim. So I'm I'm riding with the good guys on that one, but yeah, I, I have the same prediction: two and one, same games, having wins and losses. Again, we were we were talking before the show, and and we'll wrap up in just a second here. We were talking about like what the Magic's record needs to be over the course of these next eleven games. The Magic have not lost to a team below five hundred this year at home. They have after that Memphis game, they have four home games left. Three of them, Memphis, Portland. Chicago below five. So right now you could say the magic should win all three of those games, right? You split golden state in LA. That'll be fine. We want to split these four home games against these better Western conference teams. Then you're at new Orleans at Charlotte. Okay. You should win at Charlotte. You have, you'll have a good chance against new Orleans, especially if they don't have Brandon Ingram back. And then you're at Houston, at Milwaukee, at Philadelphia, at home for Milwaukee. Like the Magic getting six or seven wins down these final, you know, eleven games should be doable. If you get to seven wins in these last eleven games, you're you're basically guaranteeing yourself you're not going to be any lower than the five seed. Yeah, four maybe. Yeah, possible as well. Mm-hmm. Three maybe. I mean, we're a game back right now. Who knows what's going to happen? Right. Still, no OG Ananobi, Julius Randle isn't back. Who knows what's going to happen there? Yeah. Okay. What do we say? We go ahead and put a bow on this one and wrap it up. Yeah, let's do it. 
Okay, folks, that is going to do it for this one. Please remember, after every single Magic game, we do a post-game live on YouTube presented by Rockham, hosted by our guy, producer Kevin. Please be sure to check into those. We are ramping up for the postseason here. And when we get into the playoffs, we're not doing Monday and Thursday shows. We're doing a show after every single game. So we will be, um, you know, you see these dogs in your yard. Just know I'm upstairs going hard, as they say. <laughs> so uh, that's going to do it for this one. For Luke Sylvia, this has been Jonathan Osborne. You all have been listening to The Six Man Show, and we will catch you guys next time. See ya. Thanks for listening to The Sixth Man Show. Be sure to subscribe on iTunes and Spotify to get new episodes downloaded directly to your phone. If you enjoyed the show, please take a minute to give us a five-star rating and a review. It helps out the show a lot. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Sixth Man Show. We'll catch you guys next time. Go Magic!